They filed quietly, somewhat hesitatingly, from the belly of a chartered airliner at San Francisco Airport one recent morning. A hundred Chinese immigrants fresh from Hong Kong. Their arrival was unheralded. Indeed, it was virtually unnoticed. Yet these unassuming men, women, and children are part of a profound human drama unfolding daily in San Francisco. It began in 1965 when Congress abolished the policy of excluding Oriental immigration. For the first time in more than three generations, Chinese settlers are arriving here in significant numbers, as many as 8,000 annually. They represent all ages and walks of life. Some are literate and highly skilled. Many are not. Few have even the faintest grasp of English. Yet they have this much in common. Nearly all are the long separated relatives of people who came here many decades ago. They are fulfilling a long cherished dream to join their loved ones in Gum San, the land of the Golden Mountains. <laughs> For the greater portion of Chinese immigrants, the journey to Gum San will end here, in San Francisco's Chinatown. They will jam into aged and overcrowded flats, compete for an ever-dwindling number of low-paying jobs, and increase the burden on already overtaxed education and health facilities. As one social agency recently warned, conditions in Chinatown might soon reach catastrophic proportions. From the concierge, presidential suites, presidential treats, Brazilian models, boiling up my feet. Ten days a month, my girl pays for lunch. Three days a week, we work out at crunch. Time after time, line after line, our stock increases, rhyme after rhyme. In the valley of San Fernando, found Q-Tips wallet in El Segundo. Bobby been spotted on Telemundo With more wild cars than a box of Uno That spin like propeller, my dog like old yella Howling at the moon, my goons echo teller <laughs> Got my hands in the pot, 500 grand in the yacht. I'm the dope man with plans to expand on every block. Wu brand, that do every hands, hard as penitentiary rock. Now put that to your temple, the Wu symbol's about to drop. Insert the beam on my Glock, got that lean in my bop. What that mean? High self esteem, scrape cream on the top. Karate chop, similar to UFC, kickbox, kick rocks. Dirty truck, a pit stop, shit, grams in a ziplock. Watch how the pit bull lock his jaws, then lock your doors. Fetch, watch the boys, hip hop, spills out my pores, I be raw. Four plus four plus seven more. The clan rock the tours. We beat them reservoir dogs. Guaranteed I bang hard. I plan to leave the game large. No brainwash. The devil himself could not persuade God. My blade sharp. Circle my square. I dare you, brave heart. Before I leave your head in your hands. What's your name, huh? My lines get in your cells like seven L's Any problem I address you like I'm sending you mail Let me do well, they'd rather see me dead or in jail But let it be my life story if they ever do tell No, I die for what I live A intimate connection for that infinite reflection That's my wife and my kids There's a price on my lid So now my stock's higher, shots fired My niggas who was tight with the kid I'm hot as hell's kitchen with the oven on Deck bomb, Teflon, the rap is nothing to a dawn If I'm frontin' and responding if not, throw up your arms, it's the killer bees swarming your set The fuck is y'all? Entering the 36, mastering the 18, flying towards chain of six Hands that are crushed bricks, backs that are break bats This is what y'all wanted back, a classic wound wizard track With mathematic actual facts that weigh heavy The universal strike and attack, dance the drunk and medley Long axe, blade, machete, the shadow stepping ninja <laughs>
Chinatown is at once the most familiar and unknown section of San Francisco. To most of us, Chinatown is Grant Avenue and its few adjoining alleys. A quaint and colorful melange of curio shops, restaurants, and oriental facades. But to some 80,000 Bay Area residents of Chinese ancestry, Chinatown is the capital of oriental culture in the Western Hemisphere. They know it as Wa Fao, a Cantonese term meaning Chinese city. Affluent Chinese Americans from Knob Hill and the Richmond District, Diamond Heights and the suburbs, come here to shop, to dine, or just to visit. For whether in fact or merely in spirit, Chinatown is their hometown. It is the beloved point of origin, rich in the sights, sounds, and smells of a proud heritage. Chinatown was born well over a hundred years ago. It encompasses an historic and well-defined 42 blocks of prime downtown real estate in the very heart of San Francisco's business district. Within these narrow confines dwell some 30,000 people, giving Chinatown a population density second only to the tenement districts of New York City. But in reality, Chinatown has far outgrown its traditional boundaries taking in ever larger sections of the once predominantly Italian North Beach area. Behind the quaint architecture and neon lights of Grant Avenue, much of Chinatown is a squalid ghetto. Its problems are much the same as those existing in any other urban slum. In some respects, Chinatown's problems are much more acute. As a group, the people of Chinatown are by far the poorest in the city. Well over 10% of the eligible workforce is unemployed, and many who are working earn substandard wages. At least one out of every three families in Chinatown is impoverished according to federal income standards. Housing is a most serious problem. Many families live in badly overcrowded old flats and tiny apartments, a third of which are considered substandard and unsafe. Yet the poor of Chinatown generally pay exorbitant rents, some as much as 50% of their meager incomes. And living conditions threaten to grow worse as thousands of newcomers crowd in with already cramped relatives. There is public housing in Chinatown, but the Ping Yuan Apartments, 428 units, are all occupied, and more than 500 applicants are on the waiting list. Another 94 units are planned for the elderly in Chinatown, but housing officials say at least 6,000 new units will be needed to house new immigrants. They are nowhere in sight. The Yat Tong Chow family, two adults and six young children, arrived here from Hong Kong nearly a year ago. Mr. Chow gave up a share in the family seafood business for a new life in America. He worked for a while as a janitor. The job was very long and very hard. The wage was $120 per month, or about $6.50 per day for a five-day week. Because of the hours for the job, I was unable to go to school to study English. I would like to save enough money to open a small restaurant myself. Since I have a family of eight, the children can all eventually be of great help in running my business. Also, running this trade, I would not have to worry about starving. This same fear of starving in a strange land rules the lives of most immigrants and disfigures the economic life of Chinatown. Unable to communicate, fearful of the unknown world of urban Western civilization, the Chinese immigrant must work at whatever menial job he can find, at whatever wage he is offered. The garment industry developed in Chinatown, and some shops continue to thrive today on the willingness of immigrant women to work long hours at low piecework wages. Efforts to unionize the shops have so far failed, largely because the workers themselves will not cooperate. Bernice Aston literally grew up in a Chinatown sewing factory. Well, I started working when I was four years old at the factory with my mother, cutting off threads for her. By nine years old, I was able to have my own machine where I was 
making buttonholes or putting on buttons. When you're young, you can really make a game out of it. But it gets pretty depressing if it's your real job. The labor group, I don't think, is, will be successful unless they start from working from the top. They can definitely not get any response from people who are hungry, who need the money. Because they would rather make $5 a day than to make nothing. And they'd rather not go on welfare. Most of those who have succeeded in Chinatown have done so at great personal sacrifice. Whole families would often work for years, existing at a bare subsistence level, to accumulate the capital to start a small business. Then would follow more years of labor to make the enterprise pay off. If the owners were very lucky, if sickness, fire, or some other calamity did not strike, if they did not spare themselves or their children, and if they paid proper tribute to Chinatown's internal power structure, their little business might prosper. And indeed, some penniless Chinese immigrants did prosper. A few got very rich. And with their success came a fierce pride in the fact that they did it all themselves. They owed nothing to anyone. Some insist there is no such thing as poverty in Chinatown, that what outsiders interpret as destitution is actually oriental frugality. And like self-made businessmen everywhere, they believe firmly in the virtue of the old hard way up. Paul Louis, grocer, banker, real estate developer, is one of Chinatown's financial aristocrats. I'm sure there are infractions of the minimum wage act. I'm sure there are infractions of the uh, overly long hours. Uh, what would be the alternatives? Uh, instead of having these people working in these conditions, would it be better to throw them completely upon, say, a government agency for support? In my opinion, I think if it's temporary anyway, which I think it is, it would be better to have these people for a time earning substandard wages and working under substandard conditions and not become again a charge of the government and still not kill their own incentive wanting to better their own, uh, uh, their own position. And I think this has proven out the last uh, few decades here in Chinatown. The rugged individualism of the Chinese community has earned the respect of an historically hostile, white, western-oriented majority. But Chinatown has paid heavily in human values for this acceptance. Overcrowding, poor sanitation, long hours under substandard working conditions, inadequate diet, all have inflicted their wounds. The tuberculosis rate in Chinatown is double that of the rest of the city. Three out of four persons who die of TB in San Francisco are Chinese. Experts say the overall health and sanitation conditions in Chinatown are at best grim. Mental illness is another serious and growing problem. Chinatown has the city's highest suicide rate. These conditions have always existed in Chinatown, but new voices are making themselves heard. Voices that question the economic and social status quo. Thank you. It is perhaps Council ironic that Chinatown's most severe critics are the prosperous sons of the immigrant parents who succeeded under the old system. One such is Municipal Judge Harold Lowe, who talked recently with KRON TV. World War II, you might say we had a almost a feudalistic society in the Chinese community. Uh, we had the commercial interests who uh, were able to uh, take advantage of the large population of uh, Chinese who were not able to get jobs on the outside, uh, knew very little English, uh, had uh, uh, very little opportunity to uh, escape the economic control within the Chinatown community. The, uh, controlling economic interests there, were able to get cheap labor, uh, were able to uh, get the workers to work long hours, and they were quite ready, willing to work these long hours because there was a paternalistic care of them. Chinatown, community in crisis, continues in a moment. <laughs> Oh, 
Oriental culture is not very portable. Few Chinese traditions survive well the crossing of the Pacific and the impact of Western life. Early Chinese immigrants were unable to participate in the life of frontier California. They were despised, discriminated against, deprived of property rights, and denied protection of the law. The Chinese were forced to fall back on their own cultural and economic resources. They devised institutions for governing their own affairs and dealing with the outside world. Chief among them are the family or district associations, made up of people from the same clan or area of China. In earlier times, the associations helped newcomers find work and protected their savings for the dreamed of return to the old country. Most important, the associations preserve the essence of Chinese life and thought, as well as the Chinese people, against the harsh environment of the new world. Today, the benevolent associations are the major landlords of Chinatown. They play a decisive role in the community's economic life. Some operate Chinese cemeteries and language schools. But their role in the social life of Chinatown today is more ceremonial than essential. Some members think their associations are failing in their responsibilities. The uh, family association in Chinatown today is actually a social kind of an organization. Like in the Wong family, we do have the seasonal celebration and offerings to our ancestors and the Christmas party and also the Chinese New Year party. Outside of that, except in isolated instances, we do not have any other service. At the apex of the social and economic hierarchy of Chinatown is the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association, commonly known as the Chinese Six Companies. A representative assembly of major district associations, the six companies once served as a combination legislature, judiciary, welfare agency, and chamber of commerce. One of its many accomplishments was the founding of the Chinese hospital in 1924. Lemuel Zhen, a China-born businessman and a member of the Board of Presidents, explains the role of the six companies. It is the voice of the Chinese people in America. Whenever there is a problem, or matters concerning the Chinese community, including here Chinatown, we will take up this matter and consider it. And if action is to be taken, we will recommend what action is to be taken to the community. It is in an advisory capacity, but uh, inevitably the community will always follow our recommendation. In the spring of 1966, the San Francisco Economic Opportunity Council established an English language training center. Now operated and financed entirely by the U.S. Department of Labor, the language center conducts classes from 7 in the morning until 9 at night. Most students are working adults. But powerful interests within Chinatown fought the development of the language center. As one EOC official sees it, the more English skill the people of Chinatown acquire, the more freedom they have from the old line establishment. It's 1145. Mr. Jones. Within Chinatown today, new lines of leadership are bypassing the family and district associations. New groups, formed largely by native-born Chinese, are reaching out to newcomer and old-timer alike with programs to uplift the general welfare of the Chinatown community. By openly discussing problems that formerly were hidden behind a false face of self-sufficiency, they're challenging the traditional philosophy of isolation from the outside community. Municipal Judge Harold Lowe is in the forefront of this movement. And this philosophy must break down and is breaking down that we must take care of the entire community and participate in the entire community. And I think there is new leadership developing in the Chinese community. On the other hand, by reason of fact that uh, uh, the uh, old controlling interests in the Chinese community, the family associations, six companies, and a few of the other older organizations in the community, by reason of their control of a great deal of the economic interests, uh, 
they are uh, still very powerful in the community. I think that uh, they will still be a power for uh, quite a long period of time until the new generation uh, really uh, is able to uh, convince the older people that they have to uh, take a more uh, realistic view of some of the social problems that we have in the Chinatown community. The needs of youth have been almost totally ignored in the grim preoccupation with material survival. The streets are nearly the only sources of recreation for restless Chinatown teenagers, many of whom are trapped in the worst of two worlds. Juvenile delinquency, previously unheard of in Chinatown, is on a rapid rise. An angry youth group called the Wa Ching, many of them new arrivals from China, has issued a militant ultimatum, help us or else. Their leader recently voiced the group's discontent for KRLN TV. Our problem here with the young people is that we in the Chinese community have told everyone else that we are all obedient to our parents, we are all very nice kids and so forth and so forth. And this myth has been perpetuated by the outside community who keep on telling us and point the finger at us saying that we are the model family, we are the nicest people, but the fact is we have a lot of kids running around on the street, just like any other ghetto, any other community. The things that we have to do is that we either make meaningful change to help them to assimilate into society, or else they're going to start doing something we can construct as social disruption, or violence, or riot, or whatever you might call it. In a moment, the conclusion to Chinatown. Community in Crisis. There are problems in Chinatown to be sure, but there is also promise. The promise is in the younger generation of Chinese Americans, deeply involved and committed to the larger community, yet bound by strong ties of heritage and sentiment to Chinatown. They want Chinatown to stand for something more substantial than tourist attractions and sweatshops. They wanted to represent the best of both cultures, not the worst. Unfortunately, we have a community which may is sort of has a divided leadership. Those that are quite capable of taking care of affairs within the Chinatown community, but once they are outside of the community, which they very definitely have to deal with, the school boards, the board of supervisors, the health agencies, the poverty people, and uh, the health and welfare agencies, that they are either not attuned or unable to uh, deal appropriately with these other agencies, and there there is a real leadership gap. Once we've established a new degree of leadership in the Chinese community, they can bridge both uh, the old and the new, then I think we can begin solving some of our problems. Assignment 4 is produced in the community interest by the documentary department of KRON-TV. Be with us again for our next report to the West on Assignment 4.